Good morning, Viola. Will you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Mm. <clears throat> Witness, come and see, go and do. Acts 1.8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. John 4, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come, see a man that told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Revelation 5. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one on heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and, horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out of all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature and on heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Please be seated. This world is desperate for the good news. It's the best story ever told that is hardly ever told. It's the sweetest news ever shared that is hardly ever shared. It's the most gracious invitation ever given but hardly ever offered. The gospel is bold and urgent and it demands a response. It pushes one outside of oneself and gives life. When we encounter the good news of Jesus, it calls us to something bigger that is outside of ourselves. The gospel calls us to be a witness to what we have seen and what we have heard. We come to the throne of God and see him in all his glory. We then go and become a witness to all nations. We must first come and experience the grace and transforming power of Jesus. Then we become his witnesses to the world. Because when we witness the living God, we become a new creation that has to testify. Witnesses have to testify. We look to Isaiah, a man unworthy to be a witness. But the beauty of this is that the worthiness of the witness is not contingent upon the witness, but rather upon what he has witnessed. For when we witness God, he makes us worthy to be witnesses. It is only after that that we then go and testify to the world what we have experienced. From this, we see that witnessing the Lord is the foundation and fuel behind missions. 
From this comes an inevitable reaction, a fire in our bones, and to be a witness to the world. We see this through the story of the Samaritan woman in John, a broken sinner who is hiding in fear and shame, yet she witnesses Jesus Christ and experiences living water that quenches her thirst. As a response, she is transformed out of sin and shame and empowered by this good news. She immediately runs to the town, leaving behind her water jar, and testifies to everyone with a simple invitation. Come and see. And so we move forward to Acts 1-8. The very last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. He gives them his power and authority to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has given all believers the Holy Spirit in order to empower us to be his witnesses. Since we first witnessed Christ and what he did for us on the cross, we are now sent to our friends, to our families, to our cities, to our nations, and to the ends of the earth to be witnesses of this great love. Jesus came to be worthy for the unworthy. He came to be sin for the sinful, and he came to be a savior for the hopeless. In response to that truth, we are simply called to testify to the grace and love we have received and bring others into that. So why do we witness? We find our answer in the culmination in Revelation 5. Since Christ alone is the only one worthy of worship, he is the only one that can justify mankind. Since we have witnessed this Christ who reconciles us to the Father, we are compelled to go so that all nations, tribes, and tongues will stand together to worship at the throne of the Almighty God. We are witnesses of the risen Christ. Come and see. Go and do. We've been praying over this week for 365 days, and as our staff has prayed, and they've labored, and they've worked hard, and they've had nights without sleep, we have just been asking ourselves from a position of humility and a position of prayer, God, this is your conference, and it's your week, so what do you want us to say? What does the Lord have for us this week? I think the first question that we came to is, why would we go? Why would we go? Why would we go to the farthest ends of the earth or to our neighbors, something that could be uncomfortable to share the good news? Why would we proclaim? Why would we lay down our futures, our comfortability, our 401k, our house in the suburbs, the American dream, our family, and possibly our own lives down? What could be compelling enough to give that all up? And we believe the answer is the gospel message. The gospel message at its core is we were once lost and now found. We were once dead and now we are alive. We've witnessed the glory of God, his divine hospitality and his tender love. He adopted us and brought us into his family, and we received the title of sons and daughters. But more than that, we received the title of witnesses. Being a witness changes everything about the way that we are, what we thought we were going to do with our life, every plan that we have, we lay it down and we accept his. We become about his mission. There's a quote by John Piper that says, missions exist because worship doesn't, and our worship must lead to missional living, which means being a witness is not for the ICS or for the Bible majors, for those who want to go into vocational ministry or vocational missions. It's for all those who belong to Jesus. So it's not for certain people, it's for all people who were once lost but now found because they know the Good Shepherd. From this, we don't go out of guilt, we don't go out of shame, we don't go because we feel that we should because it's our duty. We go out of joy, gospel proclamation is a joy. It's not because we're good speakers or good people or even worthy people, it's because we know the one who is good. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced but this fall I started watching a TV show on Netflix and I got hooked, and I'm pretty sure that every single person in my life knew that I was watching that TV show. I would talk, it would come up in conversations, I would bring it up with friends. It just came out of my mouth because it was something that was good, so I told other people about it. And why is the good news any different, the best news that's ever been heard? Why would we keep that? How much would we have to hate someone to not tell them the sweetest news? Hmm. So one of the first points we want to hit this year is that this theme witness, it's an identity. Um, it's not an option, it's not an add-on to the Christian faith, it's not an accessory. Every Christian in this room, if you've experienced Jesus, you are a witness. Um, this, gives you <laughs> <it's my boy. laughs> um, this gives you a new identity. Jesus takes away these false identities of, of worthlessness, of identities even in good things, and he gives you this new one that you are a son, you are a witness. And therefore, since we are all witnesses, therefore we have to testify. Because that's, that's the whole purpose of being a witness, is experiencing and then testifying to what you've experienced. So this year, we wanna push Biola, push ourselves to the brink of our faith. Either we are for Jesus, or we are against him. Either we are a witness and we've experienced him, or we are not. There, there is no in-between with Jesus. He calls us radically to give up our lives, our, our families, our friends, our futures, our, our hopes and dreams and ourselves for, to follow him and to pick up our cross. But the, but the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he doesn't just take everything away, but he gives us something new. He gives us his new identity as a witness, but he also fulfills us. He redeems us. He saves us, and he gives us a new hope. 
When we say these words, we go to a Christian school, probably a lot of you like me grew up in the church, but we have these Christianese terminology that we use. Witness, disciple, missionary, the great commission, the way. But what does that even mean? What is the way of Jesus? When we say, come and see, go and do, what, are we ask, what is God asking us to do? The way is orienting ourselves around the way of Jesus because we become like the people we spend time with. You can look around and show me your five closest friends and I'll show you you, you're the sum of them. We care about the things that the people that we know and spend time with care about. We speak like them, we dress like them. You see this in Viola culture, probably so many of you said that you would never wear Birkenstocks, but here we are. You become like the people and the community that you are around. So if we belong to Jesus, if we spend time with Jesus, we will become like Jesus. In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said to Simon and Peter, he said, come and I will make you fishers of men. If you grew up in the church, you probably heard this and it was like, wow, how funny and clever is Jesus? Because they're fishermen, so fishers of men. But that's not actually what that means. It's a pretty well-known phrase in that series of time. What fishers of men meant was just a good teacher. He said, come and I will make you a good teacher. You see, Jesus was not the only rabbi in that time, and rabbis had disciples, or maybe a better word would be apprentices. These apprentices gave up their entire lives to be like their rabbi for the hope that they would one day be a good teacher. They lived with their rabbi. They would sleep on the floor when their rabbi slept on the bed. They would eat what their rabbi ate. You could look at a disciple. You could look at an apprentice, and by the way they spoke, and by what they said, and by their actions, you could tell and pick and choose who, what rabbi they belonged to. So when the world looks at us, do they see that we belong to our rabbi? Do they see Jesus when we speak? Do, we see, does he, do they see him when we talk? Do they see him by our actions, the people we surround ourselves with, the places they go? Do they look at us and do they see Jesus? It's kind of like the difference between the sun and the moon. The sun is the origin of light. It, it produces the energy. The moon just reflects it. God is not asking us to be perfect. He's not asking us to be God because he is so capable of that. He is asking us to be the moon, to reflect the good, holy, sweet God that we see through the Bible. That is all he's asked for us is to be a witness, to testify to what we've seen. So now that we've kind of established what does it mean to come and see, uh, I want to touch a little bit on go and do. Um, so, so we are not worried about the result of witness. We're not worried about the going to do, because if you've truly experienced Jesus, you will naturally go and do. You will naturally go and, and share this good gospel. And so imagine for a second um, this, this quick story. Say this morning I woke up. Um, I had my usual bowl of Lucky Charm cereal to start my day. <laughs> I got dressed, and I started walking to, to school. And so I was passing Stage Road, stage road and I, I stopped over the train tracks, and I dropped my phone in the middle of the train tracks. And when I went to pick it up, boom, I was hit by a train. Completely smothered, completely pancaked. Um, a whole 50 cab train just went right over me. It was intense, um, but I got back up, I brushed the dirt off, came here, and, and now here I am. Would any of you believe me? Would any of you believe that I just got hit by a train? Do I look like I got hit by a train? And, and please, please don't actually answer that one. Um, for my self-esteem and my self-worth, don't, don't answer that one. Um, but you guys, you guys would call me fake. You'd call me a hypocrite. Uh, you'd say, there's no way you experienced that because you look exactly the same as when you did this morning. You don't look any different from when you were hit by the train or before you hit by the train and now. I think sometimes the world looks at us that way. That we, we talk about this Jesus that has redeemed us, that has saved us, that has given us new life, new hope, grace, and freed us from shame. But do we live any different? Are we any different than who we were before? Are we any different from the rest of the world around us that doesn't have the same hope and the same joy and peace that we have? Because we can talk all we want about how we got hit by this train, but if we don't actually look like it, no one's gonna believe us, and no one's gonna wanna go and get hit by that train. <laughs> <laughs> and so as, as witnesses, as Christ followers, we are called to the oppressed. We are called to the poor. We are called to the marginalized, to the 1040 window, to the, to the women and children caught in sex trafficking. As Christians, with the world dying physically and spiritually around us, we cannot sit and be passive. This is a time in Christian history where we have no option. Either we are for Jesus or we are against him. When, when there are children starving and dying around the world every day, thousands of children, we cannot be passive. If we have this truth, we can't sit here and keep it to ourselves. If, if, if the homeless around us in LA are, are living and sleeping out in the cold and dying, we as Christians cannot be passive. We cannot be witnesses and, and just watch them. If there are women and children as, as young as 12 getting brought into sex trafficking, we have to be an advocate. 
We have to not only provide for their physical need, but give them living water that they will never thirst again. To, to free them from the shame and the guilt of that horrific industry. We have it. We have the good news. And so this year, we want Biola to ask this one big question at Missions Conference. Have I truly experienced Jesus? We want that question in the back of your mind at Missions Conference. Have I truly witnessed this Jesus? Because if we have, then we should just be naturally doing that. We should be naturally going to the homeless, naturally going to the poor, naturally going to the orphan, naturally going to the refugees who are dying in waters trying to flee from a country. We should just, that should be a natural response. It's the only thing that makes sense. And, and if you haven't experienced Jesus, that's okay. Every day I have to experience Jesus again. And that's what Missions Conference is all about. It's a, it's a come and see conference. Come and experience this Jesus. Come and experience this Jesus who, who set free the Samaritan woman from her shame and guilt. From all of her past of adultery, he set her free. Come and experience this Jesus that cleaned Isaiah and made him whole and worthy to be a witness. Come experience this Jesus that had made every person in this room have infinite value and worth before God. So come and experience this Jesus. We beg you, we ask you, we challenge you. We will get on our knees and ask you, and even ourselves, to come, please, experience this Jesus. And once you have, the, re the results are gonna come. Acts 1-8 has been our center rod verse for this entire year. If you have friends who are involved in SMU or if you've been to SMU chapels, you realize that we've been hitting it home all year. It's because we wanted to build this concept into Biola far before the missions conference theme was ever announced. But it's a weighty verse. This is the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended. And if we are disciples of Jesus, we should take these words pretty seriously too. Acts 1-8 is inclusive in its DNA. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Our modern day equivalent of Jerusalem would be a Biola, La Mirada. Judea would be California, our greater states. Samaria would be our country, ends of the earth all the nations. And we don't feel that this missions conference needs to be a conference where we scream at you to go. We don't need to scream at you to go to a specific place. We don't need to scream at you to go to the 1040 window. We don't need to scream at you to go to the least of these. We pray that you will be compelled to go. We wanna stir your hearts for gospel proclamation. We want to stir your hearts for the nations. We want to break your hearts for the lost because we were once lost too. And we wanna set you free into whatever God's will for you is. I don't know if you're called to be a missionary. I don't know if you're called to be in vocational ministry, but you are called to be a witness. It is in your DNA and we must go. So you're not called to whatever, whatever thing that you thought you were going to do with your life. You are a witness. You're not your major. You're a witness. You are not your Myers-Briggs. You're a witness. You're not your GPA. You're a witness. You're not a Calvinist. You're a witness. You're not an Arminian. You're a witness. You are not a Republican. You're a witness. You're not a Democrat. You're a witness. You are not what your friends have said about you. You're a witness. You're not your spiritual gifts. You're a witness. You are not what your parents think of you. You're a witness. You are not your fears. You're a witness. You are not your jealousy. You're a witness. You are not your doubt. You're a witness. You are not your anger. You're a witness. You are not your mistakes. You're a witness. You are not the lies you've been told. You are a witness. You are not your anxiety. You're a witness. You are not your appearance. You're a witness. You are not your depression. You're a witness. You are not your insecurities. You're a witness. You are not your pornography addiction. You're a witness. You are not your mental illness. You are a witness. You are not your sexual history. You're a witness. You are not your eating disorder. You're a witness. You are not your abuse. You're a witness. You are not your strengths. You're a witness. You are not your spiritual gifts. You're a witness. You are not your hopes and dreams or lack thereof, you are a witness. You are not even your own. You are a witness. We are witnesses of the risen Christ. Come and see. Go and do. Pray with me. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.